Hello and welcome to Wednesday Chapel, everybody. We're so glad you are here to sing and pray and hear a word with us. So before we start singing today, we are going to pray the Lord's Prayer together because Jesus shows us and tells us that the kingdom has been made available to us. And through him, we can step right into it. Everybody who calls his name and follows his way. So with that said, I invite you to pray this out loud wherever you are right now with us because we need to invite the kingdom power that Jesus tells us about into all the spaces we are in right now uh, in order to worship him fully in spirit and in truth. So let's do that together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. The Spirit of the Lord is here. 
your spirit in us. We call to you, we need you, Father, we need you, Jesus. center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you.
That's exactly what you are. You are the center of our lives. Lord, when we sing that, that that nothing else matters, there is nothing in this world that can even slightly compare to your greatness and to your goodness. Everything here pales. Everything here uh, will vanish, Lord, but you are steadfast, you're eternal, you're constant. Lord, I thank you for that reminder that we can turn to you even when, when things seem unsure, when, when we feel uneasy, when things are just kind of a mess. We're broken people, and yet we can look to you and say nothing else matters. My arms are open, and I'm running to you. I'm running to your arms. That's all he asks. He's asking for relationship, not religion. There's so much power in that. Lord, I thank you for the reminder, and I thank you for this, this space to worship. We love you so, so much in your heavenly name. Amen.
Hello, Kaleo Chapel. Welcome. Uh, my name is Sam McGeary, and it is an honor to be before you today. It's been a minute since I've been able to be up um, on a stage preaching, so I want to thank Pastor Tatiana and Pastor Jason for inviting me here. Uh, well, happy Black History Month. We are in the month of February, um, and it's a time where we get to honor and celebrate um, black men and black women who have contributed to our society, our community. And so I want to encourage you to continue to lean in, to continue to educate yourself, to learn. Uh, don't just wait for a diversity chapel. Don't just wait for Imago Day. Um, but be intentional with, with how you learn. Be intentional with celebrating history. And you can't celebrate what you don't know. So I want to encourage you. Um, as Pastor Wesley mentioned last uh, Kaleo Chapel, that black history is American history. Um, and so we get this opportunity to dive into deep relationships with people. We get this opportunity to learn. Um, we get to uh, discover more and more of what black people have contributed um, to our community here in APU. And so whether it's supporting black owned businesses, whether it's reading, whether it's um, listening, whether it's um, studying, um, I invite you to engage and to lean in. I want to open up this message um, highlighting someone um, in the black community who I believe has made incredible contributions to this uh, earth and specifically to the U.S. Um, and to circles of men and women of color. Uh, former U.S. Representative John Lewis, uh, who passed away this uh, past July in 2020. He was most known as a civil rights activist, uh, as a part of the big six alongside Dr. Martin Luther King. He was known to be a leader, a politician, a congressman, a statesman. He was a father. He was a son. He, he was a husband. Uh, he was someone that loved to preach as a young boy. But he found that even in his own desires of wanting to become a minister and a preacher, he realized that God was calling him to something greater. And so he committed his life to serving. He committed his life to work that would liberate, that would equalize, that would empower communities of, of people who were marginalized, who were oppressed, who were treated unjustly. And I found it so fascinating that I, um, I started researching him. I, I started watching a, a film, a, a documentary on his life. And I know that uh, films can't capture everything. Um, but I was so moved by what I was seeing about this man who was so um, tender and kind, but so resilient and courageous and so adamant about uplifting people that did not have a voice. In this documentary, there was a woman, and she was an, a fellow colleague of his, and she said he was willing to get a concussion so that the conscience of this country would be awakened. You see, John Lewis was most known for what he called good trouble. And good trouble, he states, he says, when you see something that is not right, when you see something that is not just or fair, you say something, you do something, you get in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble. And I, I, I was so moved by that statement because I realized like, wow, he's associating trouble to something being good, but it was, it was his heart and his motive and his intention and his willingness to get hurt, to suffer, to endure pain, to endure loss, to be arrested, to lay down his life for a cause that he felt called to. In the closing statement of the film, John says, we will create a beloved community. We will redeem the soul of America. There may be some setbacks, some delays, but as a nation and a people, we will get there. We shall overcome. I pondered these words that John Lewis was so after the soul of a country that had not treated him fairly, of a country that had not uh, accepted him, of a country that had rejected him. And in, in that moment, watching that film and hearing him and seeing the legacy of his life, I was reminded of Jesus. I was reminded of the ways that Jesus was willing to give up his life for us because it was what he was sent here to do. It is what he was called to do. 
So in prepping for my message today, I was gripped by, the, by this statement of John Lewis because I realized this mirrored the sentiment of the gospel. And as I began to recall the great lengths of what Jesus had done, the living God, the Messiah, the Christ, that as Philippians 2.6 tells us, though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Why would Jesus do that? Why would Jesus step down from his throne to take on human flesh, to come sit with you and I, to come die and suffer, to be raised again, to give us life? And it's so fascinating that a life laid down means that we get to have life. And as disciples, we're not just invited to this. No, we're called to it. We're called to do the same. Pray with me. Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to speak before your people. And I pray, God, that as we dive deeper into the gospel of Matthew, Lord, that you would show yourself, that you would reveal yourself. And God, I pray that you would move in this place and have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me to Matthew 16. It is going to show up on your screen. Uh, but if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to, to go there as well. Um, in Kaleo Chapel, it's the opportunity to be able to dive deeper into one book of the Bible. And uh, the book for this year is, is Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, I'm going to focus specifically on Matthew 24 through 28. But I, I'm going to start from verse 21 to give a little bit of context. So let's read. It says, from that time... Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Verse 24. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man in his coming. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to take this time to address this idea or this notion or this call, this invitation of taking up your cross and following Jesus. Many of us may be familiar with this text. May, many of us may have um, heard this growing up. If you were raised in church, if you were raised in Christian circles, um, you may understand that, okay, if, if I want to follow Jesus, I got to pick up my cross. But, but what does that actually mean? And I want to revisit this uh, because I believe sometimes we need a refresher and we need a reminder of the personhood of Jesus. We need to be reminded not just of his words, but of his actions and how he lived out his life. Like the Pharisees and the people that grew up with Jesus, they were so familiar with him that they could not fully accept accept who he was as the Messiah, who he was as the Christ. They had their own expectations. They had their own ideas. They had their own um, preconceived notions as to what the Messiah, what the king would come and be like here on this earth. But I believe part of my assignment today 
is to remind us as a people that we belong to God and that we belong to Christ. And because we belong to Christ, we have to understand who Jesus is. Not this pretty picture that we've painted, not this uh, this person that we've um, idealized as, okay, he has to look this way and he has to be this way. But no, let's get reacquainted with, with Jesus in the text. And the Jesus that we come to see in scripture is one that suffered, one that was acquainted with suffering and pain, one that knew what it was like to lay down his life. He put aside his status. He put aside the approval of humanity. And he did not care if religious leaders understood him. He did not care if people were willing to accept him because he was on a mission to do what his father had sent him here to do. He came to turn this kingdom upside down. If you look back at Matthew chapter 16, you see the way that the text is laid out that it shows hey, this is who Jesus is. This is the unveiling of his identity and his character. In the beginning of that chapter, we see that the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they're demanding a sign, like prove yourself, prove yourself. And then we see Jesus asking Peter, which Pastor Wesley preached on last Kaleo, of uh, him asking Peter and his disciples, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter responds, you're the Christ. And now here in Matthew 21, Jesus is preparing his disciples and saying, okay, you're, you're going to see me, you're going to know me, but you have to know that I'm called to suffer and that I must go. I must go and die. I must go and lay down my life. And Peter, the one who just said, you're the Christ, thinking, oh, I know Jesus, I know Jesus, Jesus, you don't have to do that. You don't have to go and suffer. You don't have to go and lay down your life. No, 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 not you, Jesus. I, I know, I know. I, I got a word from heaven that you are the Christ. And so I, I'm feeling myself and I know, Jesus, that you don't have to do that. Nah. -uh. And immediately, Jesus turns to Peter and says, get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance. Other, other translations say you're, you're a stumbling block. In other words, you're in the way of me moving forward. You see, I have to carry my cross. You don't know the burden that is before me. I have to do what my father has sent me here to do. You are in the way. And I need to move forward. I need to move forward to endure the suffering, to endure death, so that I might be raised by the Spirit. Amen. I'm going to be raised for your sake, but I have to die for your sake. I have to die. And he tells him, your mind is not set on the things of God, but on the things of man. So this is the perfect opportunity for Jesus to now teach his disciples. And he uses Peter, this interaction with Peter as a lesson, as a reference point. And this is his opportunity to teach them and to show them that, hey, if you want to come after me, if you want to really know me, if you want to follow me, you're my disciples. If you want to learn from me as your rabbi, if you want to learn from me, then you got to deny yourself. You got to take up your cross and follow me. And this cross may not be easy to bear, but eventually you're going to have to choose. You're going to have to evaluate and reason. You're going to have to decide whether you're going to put your mind on the things of God which for us is counterintuitive, but you still have to choose. And I wanna ask this question to you, what is your mind set on in this season right now? What are you focused on? Because deny means to reject. And in this case, Jesus is saying, you have to reject your will and your way. 
You have to reject your way of doing life. You have to reject your way of thinking. You have to reject your desires to do whatever the heck you want to do. If your mind is not set on God, on the things above, how will you be able to choose to deny yourself? You see, you can't have it your way and follow Jesus. The disciple is not above the teacher. And our way is limited. Friends, our way, we fall short. Our way usually places our desires above Christ. And can we just be honest for a moment? That if you had it your way, things would look different right now. Think about it. Okay, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just share for me. If I had it my way right now in this season, I would have way more control. I would know what the future holds for me. I wouldn't have to do hard things or have hard conversations. I wouldn't have to experience pain and loss. I wouldn't have to keep going to therapy and crying and processing and doing things that I'm like, oh my gosh, this is heavy, this is hard. If I had it my way, I would just be living my best life and not looking back. If I had it my way, we would not be in this pandemic. If I had it my way, we would not have to deal with um, social justice, racial inequality. If I had it my way, we wouldn't have to deal with death. If I had it my way, we wouldn't have to deal with political divide. If I had it my way, things would look different. If I had it my way, But I don't have it my way. And friends, getting out our own way is contrary to the nature and identity and calling of Jesus. And I'm going to keep saying this over and over again, that to know Jesus is to be acquainted with his suffering. To serve him means that we take up our cross. And, and to know Jesus is to know that we can't run from what God has called us to. If you want to be his disciples, you get the choice. If you want to follow him, if you want to be transformed to look like him, not just the better version of yourself, but to look like him, to live like him, you cannot run from the cross. You cannot run from enduring suffering. You cannot run from pain. And I thank God that we're not just out here carrying crosses for the sake of suffering. No, we are following, accompanying the one that is taking the lead. And the one that has gone before us, that is Jesus. It seems ironic to me when I read this text that losing everything for the sake of Christ means gaining life. Verse 25, it says, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? I've been so challenged with this text in this season, in a pandemic, being isolated, I've been so challenged trying to navigate what this actually means for our current context and time where we experience such divide, where we experience such loss. We're approaching a full year of this pandemic and how everything's shifted and that all of our lives have been impacted. Hundreds and thousands of lives have been impacted by this, whether it be actual death, whether it be job loss, whether it be a change of plans, whether it be a transition. It's loss. It's heavy. It's changing. And I think about things that are no more, and I think about things that we have picked up as a result of having let things go. And I think about the rhetoric that I continuously hear over and over and over again from people that constantly say, I just, I want a sense of normal. I want to go back. I wish this never happened. 
And we're so desperate for some sense of control. We're so desperate for a time where we thought that we knew everything. We're so desperate for our way, for our rights, for our comfortable lives. We're so desperate for the moments that we used to have, thinking that it was great or it was good or it was what I knew. But the moment that it was shaken up, we didn't know what to do with ourselves. And that life pre-pandemic, I thought that I knew it. I thought that I wanted it. But deep down, I can say now that I want freedom. I want freedom for my aching soul. I want freedom deep down within me. And I didn't realize until the loss, until the shift, until the change, until things were taken out of my hands right before my eyes, I didn't realize what I actually had. I believe that Jesus is offering us a full life, but it will require us laying down our life for him. Because if you lose your life for the sake of Christ, you will gain it. You will gain it. And so I've had to ask myself, am I willing to lose the life that I knew so that I may gain Christ? Am I willing to experience the pain, the suffering? Am I willing to endure? And maybe that's you today asking yourself, do I really want this new life? And maybe you're looking at what is still in your hands. What are you still holding on to? Is it your will? Is it your plans? Is it the way that you thought your life should be? Is it the way that you thought APU should be? Is it the way that you thought your community should be? Is it the way that, the, that you thought our society should be? Jesus is offering he is inviting, he is calling his disciples to choose him, to follow him, to lay down their life. So disciples of Jesus, it's time to pick up your cross. It's time to set your mind on the things above and to not get caught up on the stumbling block that would prevent you from moving forward. For me, the stumbling, the stumbling block is pride. But I got to lay that down. I got to lay down my pride and humble myself and submit myself to the one that has already given himself. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance. And endurance means that it is a capacity to continue to bear up under difficult circumstances. So let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider, consider Jesus. Consider, think about, ponder, meditate, weigh out the options. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Jesus endured so that you would not grow weary or faint-hearted in this walk. Jesus endured suffering so that you can bear up the hard things. Jesus endured so that you can keep going, walking out your faith. Jesus endured so that you could have life. Don't grow weary. 
Don't grow weary. Don't throw in the towel and give up and think that this is all a waste. It was all for nothing. Why am I even here? What purpose do I have? No, consider the one that continued to endure towards Jerusalem and said, I must suffer. When he was in the garden of Gethsemane, pleading to his father, Father, if there's any other way, but not my will, God, your will be done. Consider him. Consider him that endured for your sake. Don't grow weary. There is joy that was set before Christ. Don't grow weary. There is joy that is set before us as believers that come into the faith, that come into the body, that come into the covering of Christ. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. We come to know Jesus fully when we understand his suffering and his ability to endure. Don't throw in the towel simply to keep your life as you know it. So what's keeping you from taking up your cross? Is it pride? Is it fear? Is it control? Is it bitterness? Is it resentment? Is it unforgiveness? Is it holding on to what you knew, thinking that that was great? Is it holding on to that life that you thought you had power over, you thought you had control of? What is keeping you from taking up your cross and following Christ? You will find your life. You will find your true self. You will find your soul when you lose it for Christ. Let God have his way in your life. Is it hard? Absolutely. Are you going to want to quit? For sure. Is it challenging? Always. But it's better. It's better God's way. It's better to lay your life down for Jesus than to go about your every day thinking that I'm going to do me. I'm not going to think about the person to the left or right of me. I'm not going to think about the person that might be affected by my actions. Nah. It's better God's way. It's better walking the way of Jesus. There's life on the other side of it. It's time to carry your cross. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for enduring. Thank you for coming down from your throne to be Emmanuel, God with us. To live a life that was contrary to what we would believe as humans. To live a life that was humble and self-sacrificial. One that was rooted and driven in love. God, we pray right now, Father, for those that are listening under the sound of my voice, God. Those that are teetering and tottering back and forth, trying to hold on to what they know, trying to hold on to this life that they think will fulfill them. And Father, I just pray, Lord, that you would reveal yourself, that you would show yourself. And God, I thank you for your grace that meets us there your grace that carries us, your grace that helps us move forward, God, one step at a time. And so, Father, we just yield to you. Would you transform us to look more like you, God, to look more like your son, Jesus? And I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are aiding us every step of the way, that you are the paraclete that comes alongside us to to help us when we are weary. We give you our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.